Well, this is Tanner Dykin, uh, once again, a uh, pastor at Open Door Baptist Church. Uh, I'm continuing the review that I'm uh, going through, the a debate that I had with Matt McDougall last month, and uh, just going through uh, his uh, first rebuttal tonight. And uh, just before we get started, uh, I, I skipped over about the, the first two arguments that he made in his rebuttal. Uh, because I, I felt that I had addressed them uh, well enough in the first part of this review and uh, didn't need to go back over them. Uh, there may be a couple of places uh, here in this uh, uh, video, this rebuttal, that uh, I might skip over just for the sake of brevity, just so that we can get through them, uh, because I, again, had addressed the arguments, essentially, that he's making in the first part of the uh, of the, the review that we're doing here. And uh, I may uh, or may not do uh, any more after this. Uh, I'll have to go in and review the second night of the debate that, where we had our, our interaction, our, our cross-examination slash uh, uh, question-answer period. And uh, I'll just look and see if there's anything that I didn't quite get the opportunity to address uh, on that night. And uh, if I, if I find anything that I, I feel needs to be mentioned, uh, I'll put them together and I'll go through those, uh, just those parts probably uh, in uh, another installment of this. But if not, then this may be the uh, last installment of it. Uh, and so with that, we'll just go ahead and uh, we'll jump in. Uh, like I said, we're jumping into the, uh, 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 the uh, second part, or uh, the, the uh, middle just uh, of the uh, first rebuttal that Matt uh, gave uh, and uh, so we'll uh, just go ahead and we'll start and hear what he has to say. I do want to go to Romans 4 and verse 3 because um, Abraham was not justified by being so good that God had to save him. When, when God told Abraham to do stuff Abraham did it. When he was called out uh, Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, by faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed. This is long before he, he had this uh, circumcision or long before he was um, with, uh, had marital relations with Sarah. He obeyed. By faith he obeyed. That's what faith is. It's an obedient faith. He wasn't so good that God was going to save him. He just did what God told him to do. Okay? And in Romans 4. All right, uh, so the first uh, text that he goes to here, or not the first, but the first we're looking at, uh, is Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, he looks down and uh, he sees uh, that Abraham obeyed, uh, that he, he did what he was uh, asked to do. And uh, he takes from this, uh, and he, he wants us to take from this, uh, that Abraham, by obeying, was uh, counted righteous. Um, uh, and he, 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 at another time in the debate, he, he goes through a few other, uh, parts of this, uh, a few other, uh, uh, figures here, uh, that they, uh, did such and such that they, uh, say Noah built the ark, uh, that, uh, uh, Enoch was translated, uh, Abel, uh, offered a sacrifice. Um, and he, he essentially wants us to take from this that, uh, because they did these things through faith, that they had faith, and they also uh, did these things, they, they obeyed, that therefore God counted them righteous. Uh, like we've been seeing a, a theme in, in this kind of, of theology is that it, it doesn't stop to look at the context of a passage. It doesn't stop and actually read the passage and, and walk through the passage and see what the passage is, is saying on its own terms. Uh, and I'd just like to do that now. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 is not talking about uh, how these figures were counted righteous before God, how they obtained uh, righteousness in, in, in his sight. But rather what it's saying is that by faith, they obtained a good report as it says in, in uh, verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good report, by faith, that is, they obtained a good report. And what that obviously means is that in the world, uh, that they are known to be good to us by what they did, that they in fact became 
elders. They became uh, the people that we look back to and, the, and that we uh, think fondly of uh, because of uh, their faith and that their faith, their genuine faith, uh, brought them to do these certain things. Uh, it's not talking about how they were justified before God, but how they have a good report before us, that they believed God and believing they then did uh, obedient things or they did good things or, or whatever. And uh, another uh, 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 reason that I say this is because... In, it, in some of these, it, it explicitly just says that. In uh, verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He obtained witness that he was righteous, that, that, that people witnessed that he was righteous because he offered up the sacrifice. He did it, of course, by faith. But they didn't see directly his face, his faith. They saw what he did. And by that, he was, uh, obtained a, a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaketh. He being dead, he, he still testifies to the fact that he was righteous, the fact that he uh, was a, a man who feared God. Again, in, in verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Now, if we're going to say that the, the common denominator uh, between all of these is that they did something and by it they, uh, um, they obtained uh, justification, they obtained righteousness. Well, then Enoch kind of, uh, he breaks the mold here. Because Enoch isn't even said to do anything in this context. It says that he was translated. That is, he was taken by God. Uh, the, again, not something he does, but something that God does. But nonetheless, the, the, the point that it takes from the fact that he was translated is that for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So he has a testimony. He, he, he showed forth the fact that he pleased God. And so by faith, he obtained a good report also. And this, this um, line of interpretation follows all the way through the chapter. Uh, nowhere in the chapter is a person's good works connected as, as being the reason why God justified them. It's not found in this passage at all. And so going to Hebrews 11 uh, does nothing to forward Matt's argument. Uh, and so with that, we'll go on and we'll see what else he has to say. Four, it says, um, what shall we say then? What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not accounted as grace, but as debt. These are works to boast of. We can't go around and feed the poor and do these really good works that, so much that God will save us. We can't uh, wield something over God's head and say, you have to save me. Look how many poor people I fed, or look how, how much good I've done. We can't do that kind of work. And even in the context, it's works of boasting. These are not works of obedience. When it says uh, Abraham believed God, he, he wasn't working uh, just so good works that God was going to save him. Abraham was doing what God said. When he believed God, he used his body to produce a child, an heir. And you can see that in Romans 15, in verse uh, 4 through 6. Right after that, in, in chapter 16 in Genesis, Sarah gives up on it. They, they had given up on it, and she puts forth the uh, the harlot to have I, uh, Ishmael. So, yeah, it is a marital relations thing. Uh, the uh, next argument he uses, uh, partly I've already addressed this in the uh, last installment of this review, 
uh, but he uh, goes to Romans 4 and he, he attempts to try and, and uh, explain what Romans 4 means to us because I, I had brought it up in my opening statement and he and in uh, my rebuttal and he's trying to uh, he's trying to explain what Romans 4 uh, means. Uh, now I'd just like to note uh, in his uh, in his rebuttal to my point, uh, he didn't read uh, verse five. Uh, he only read verses three and four. Uh, of course, I read more of, of Romans chapter four than just that. And really, he stopped short of of the full argument that's that's being made in Romans four. Uh, but even what he he brought up doesn't. Uh, and, and the points that he brought up to, to try and explain the passage don't do justice to the passage uh, at all. Um, he began reading in, in uh, verse uh, 3. Uh, I'll back up to verse 1. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Uh, the uh, uh, point about Abraham here is that he did not work. He, he did not do anything. Uh, the, 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 he uh, tried to bring up that before this, Abraham had, uh, he had left his father's country and he had, gone into another country the problem is is it's never that act is never associated with abraham's justification it's never called the occasion of, of or, or, or the reason why god justified abraham the fact that he left his father's country here it says that he was not justified by works and if he were justified by works he would have a reason to glory uh if, if it was the fact that he was justified because he left his own land, uh, his, his uh, family's land, the, the, the place where his fathers were born, and went into Canaan, if that were the reason God justified him, well, that's, that's work. That, that, that's a reason of boasting here. But that, that's not how it is before God. But it simply says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's all. That's all it says here, uh, that he believed, and it was counted to him for righteousness. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And that's the part where Matt uh, didn't read. Uh, likely he just... He just skipped over it and I, I understand that but it's it's a very important path it's a very important part of the passage uh to him that worketh not just as abraham uh is is not said to have been justified by anything that he did to him that worketh not to him that does nothing but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness not doing anything, but only believing. That's how Abraham was justified. And that's how uh, later in chapter 4, it says that we are justified. In uh, verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. In the same way Abraham was justified, we are justified. And this is something that I, uh, I, I, I really wish I had maybe pressed a little bit in the debate, is that if we're saved by the same way that Abraham was, if we're justified, counted righteous in the same way he was, then does that mean that that Abraham was baptized, uh, or, or that uh, we have to be 
uh, we have to leave our own uh, land or the, the, the place of our fathers and go into another land and uh, that we have to marry and, uh, and uh, have, as he says, relations and uh, be circumcised and do all of these other things uh, that Abraham did by obedience in order to be justified? Or does it mean that the same one occasion at which Abraham was justified is the same one occasion that we are justified at? That is by faith in Jesus Christ, in faith, by faith in the descendant of the woman, the, 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 the serpent crushing seed. And uh, so uh, his, his interpretation of, of Romans 4 is, is very lacking. And uh, uh, I, I hope he uh, comes to understand this. Uh, you went to Ephesians 2. Now, in context, we can judge what kind of works these are, can you? And Ephesians 2, and you're a studied man. You're a well-studied man. I appreciate you uh, coming to debate me, man. I, I want to say that you're a brave guy, and I appreciate you coming to show up to be able to study and talk about this. Um, I think maybe our connection's a little bit lost as far as the Internet connection, but we'll work on those things. Maybe do it again. Uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. By faith you have been saved through grace, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So these are works of boasting. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Uh, I'll just I'll make another, just a short statement here. And uh, it was brought up in the second night of the debate uh, in Ephesians 2. Um, verses 8 through 10. Uh, in the second night of the debate, Matt actually agreed to this. And so it, 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 it seems to, um, it seems to uh, throw down his interpretation that he, he just gave. But I'll, I'll mention it here anyway. Uh, in verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The very same works by which we are not saved are the exact same works that God has ordained, that God has approved of, and that I would say that he has uh, predestined for us to walk in them. Uh, these are the exact same works. And so if, if, if Matt uh, would say, and if, and if uh, any Church of Christ uh, restorationist uh, would say that we are, uh, that, that baptism, that, that any of the works which they uh, claim to be the occasion of our being justified, uh, if they are works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. If they take that, if they take baptism to be among those works, then in the context of Ephesians 2, they are not the works by which we are saved. It's, it's as clear as day here. He, he uses the same, uh, the, the same terminology in the two, two verses, in the same context. So we're not saved even by the works which God has ordained that we should walk in. We're not saved by those works. We're saved by grace through faith. And the whole operation is not of ourselves. It's God's working in us, bringing us to spiritual life, as the previous context tells to us. And so here he, he again, doesn't really understand what the text is uh, getting at. You know, quoting, I've, I've known some people to, to really mess up quoting, but let me read this again, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Well, how are these Ephesians in, in chapter 2 saved by faith? How are they saved? You said it was the gift of God, and, I, and I'll grant that God provided them a way. How are these Ephesians in chapter 2 saved? Acts 19 tells you. Acts 19 will tell you how they were saved. Acts 19, 1 through 5, uh, Paul saved them. He started the church there in Ephesus. They heard the word. 
They believed in Christ. They repented, and they were had, they had to be rebaptized. They were baptized in the John. They had to be rebaptized to get into Christ, where His righteousness is, where His blood is. I want to give you some credit, Tanner, on a few things. You you agree that in Christ is where His blood is. You agree that in Christ is where His righteousness is. Um. Uh. uh he he mentions just briefly. Uh, Acts 19 there uh, I think I let it play for a, a little long there but uh, basically what he was saying uh, with that and it was very very quick um, is he he's still talking about Ephesians 2 and he's still saying uh, he, he's still trying to, to show that this this is inclusive of us act of doing works in order to be justified and uh in order for us to be saved, and that um, I, I've already sh have shown that uh, according to Ephesians two itself, that's not the case. And, and Matt uh, agreed to a, 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 f a fundamental, um, you know, point that I made there that that seems to destroy uh, uh, the idea that we have to do certain things in order for God to have favor toward us and save us. Uh, but he goes and, and he says, well, if in order to understand Ephesians 2 and how the uh, uh, Ephesian, Ephesian believers were saved, we have to go back to uh, Acts 19. And he says we have to see how they first began to believe and, and the circumstances around how they first began to believe and how they were saved. And uh, what he's referring to is, of course, the... the, um, the uh, scene in which uh, the Ephesian believers have the baptism of, or the, the, the Ephesian disciples, they have the baptism of John, and uh, Paul comes into town and he uh, he asks them if they received the Holy Ghost, and they uh, said they, they uh, didn't know if there'd be any such Holy Ghost, and uh, he says, what are you baptized in? And they said to John, and, G and Paul says, well, John's baptism was unto belief in Jesus Christ, essentially. And they were baptized, and uh, it says that they received the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, and he's essentially saying that, see, they, they were baptized, and they were saved. And yeah, I, I, I'll say that this is, of course, the time when they were converted, right? And uh, the, 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 the doctrine of sola fide does not, uh, it does not exclude, of course, that somebody may experience justification at the time of their baptism, that they might first exercise faith they might, at the time that they're externally baptized. Uh, but uh, if we look at the context, again, if we, if we just sit on the passage for a little bit and, and see what's going on in it, uh, we can see that the emphasis that, that Paul is making, that, that the, the author of Acts is making, is not that they were not baptized properly, but rather that they did not have faith. That is the, the, uh, the linchpin on which the passage turns, whether they are believing in Christ. And that's really what's concerning to, to Paul here. Uh, if we uh, just read together in verse 1 of Acts 19, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? His, his, his concern is that since they believed, had they received the Holy Ghost? And he, he, this, is a, uh, he, this is, it implies that it's strange that if they had believed, then they ought to have received the Holy Ghost. The two go hand in hand. If you believe, then you receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, and so he's worried about whether they had believed or not. Uh, he, and they, uh, uh, they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And so that confirms his, uh, his suspicion. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Uh, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, 
that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. There it is. What Paul is worried about is their faith, is their belief that they, uh, that, that, that they should have believed on Jesus. Uh, what should have happened here, and what, or what should have happened before this, is that they should have, you know, they went and they were baptized into John's baptism. And the idea was that they naturally, as John decreased, remember John chapter 3, as John decreased and Christ increased, that the followers of John, those who had been baptized unto John's baptism, would begin to follow after Jesus Christ and that they would believe on him. That's the, um, that's the, 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 the issue here is that they hadn't, they hadn't believed on Jesus. They went and they were ritually washed, uh, in, uh, Jordan and, uh, they went out and they did not believe in Jesus. Uh, they, they missed the point of John's baptism. The, 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 this passage is not saying that they needed, uh, that, that unless they had the right baptism, then they, they couldn't be saved. But rather, unless they believed, they could not be saved. They had to believe in other words. And of course, uh, next what happens is when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized unto the faith, which they then had, you know, that they, they, they did not have it before when they were baptized. Uh, this, I think, is a good text for believers' baptism. Uh, they, they were not believing in the Messianic uh, promise, that, and they did not follow Christ when he came. But now that they trusted in Christ, they were baptized uh, in his name. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. The sign, of course, that they, uh, that they were uh, Christ's, that they had believed. And so here, uh, yeah, baptism is involved, but the point of the text is not baptism. And another point uh, to, to solidify this is at the end, the end of uh, chapter 18, immediately prior to this narrative, we have another about a man who had the baptism of John, but he believed in Jesus Christ. In, in chapter 18 and verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord knowing only the baptism of John. There, there are two marks here that tell us that he was a Christ follower and that he was saved, in fact, that, that, that he was in Christ at this time, knowing only John's baptism. The first is that he was instructed in the way of the Lord and that he, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Uh, a mark, of course, that he was following Christ, right? That he he knew of, knew the Lord, he was he was fervently speaking the things of the Lord, uh, and, and and you know he 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 knew, he knew what Christ who Christ was and what he had come to do, but also a short phrase in verse twenty five, being fervent in the Spirit. Now some would interpret this to be that he was fervent in his own spirit. He was stirred up, and you know. Uh, he, he was he was ready to go. I think that this is a reference to the Holy Ghost, though, especially given, of course, that the whole narrative, the whole build up, and 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 the thread that runs throughout the Book of Acts is the activity of the Spirit and how He works. Uh, it would be strange for the, this narrative to go through uh, without a reference to the Holy Spirit uh, throughout the whole uh, portion here. But also the fact that the definite article comes before. It's not that he was fervent in spirit or in his spirit, but he was fervent in the spirit, the spirit of God. Uh, that is what 
he was fervent in. The, the Spirit was moving in him. He, he went out, he instructed in the ways of the Lord. He taught diligently the things of the Lord. He only knew the baptism of John. But he still had the Spirit, the mark that he was in Christ, that, 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 uh, that he, was, he belonged to Christ. But he only knew the baptism of John. And so this coming right beforehand, uh, before chapter 19 and the conversion of the Ephesians, uh, we see plainly that the point is not that they only had John's baptism. And if they only had the baptism uh, that, that the apostles uh, uh, administered or, and preached, the baptism uh, of uh, Jesus, as if that is different from uh, the baptism of John, uh, if only they had that, then they would be all right. They, they would be um, fine. Uh, but the point of the passage is, is not that. It, instead, it's faith. They did not have faith. And so by faith, again, which just again backs up, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, this is completely congruent with Paul's teaching in his letter to the Ephesians uh, that they were saved by grace through faith. And so uh, we uh, will go ahead and we'll uh, listen to what Matt has to say next. I want you to, to agree to the fact that the scripture quotes that in Christ is where redemption is. And to get there, you need to be water baptized to reach that blood. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. And in Acts 2, those people were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, when you are baptized in water by faith, you contact his blood and are in and put into his body. Okay? And, and some verses to, to back that up. Look up Galatians 3 and verse 27. How many are in Christ? As many as have been baptized in Christ. Okay, so we're not saved by works of merit. You put up one A. All right. Uh, he, he made a couple of statements there. Um, he mentioned Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Uh, he mentions that, and uh, he's essentially saying that, well, you have to be in Christ, of course, uh, like I, I mentioned in the last installment of this review, you have to be in Christ in order to uh, be uh, to have the benefits of His death. Of course, that's true, but the question is: uh, Are these passages that are talking about being put into Christ uh, and, and associating that idea with baptism? Uh, are they talking about how we initiate the uh, mystical union? with Christ, or is it using baptism as language to talk about how we are united with Christ? Um, uh, 1 Peter uh, 3, uh, 21 uh, likens baptism to a figure, to, to an image, uh, rather than uh, the substance of the thing that's imaged. Uh, for this, uh, I'll just, uh, to save a little bit of time, uh, I'll I'll point everybody to a sermon that I did on baptism a couple of weeks ago. I believe it was called uh, Baptism in Light of God's Grace. And uh, in that, I, I essentially, it was more like a, just a, uh, a study more than a sermon. Uh, went through uh, most of the passages, I think essentially all the passages that are usually rallied to uh, defend this idea of uh, uh, baptism uh, as the way that we get into Christ, the way that we receive forgiveness of sins. And I went through them and uh, I, I tried to show, and I, I think I, I successfully showed that these passages are not in contradiction with sola fide. That in fact, that they, they all in their context uh, do not tell us that uh, baptism uh, is a requirement or, or the way that we initiate this mystical union with Christ or forgiveness in his name. Uh, I just kind of wanted to, to, to point everyone there uh, for just to save a little bit of time here. 
so that we're not uh, uh, going on for too long in this video. Uh, and uh, I'll just commend that to you. Uh, watch it, uh, criticize if you'd like, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be beneficial to someone. And we'll just continue on. Mm -hmm. We're not saved by works of merit. We're not saved by works of the old law. We're not saved by works of the flesh. We're not saved by sinful works. We're saved by working obedience. And I want to prove that. I want to show you that faith itself is a work, as Jesus said it was. Repentance is a work, as, as Paul said it was. And if you will look with me in Hebrews chapter 11, have, have you ever heard the Hall of Fame? I think there's a Hall of Fame maybe in... I'm just going to, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this because uh, we just, we went to Hebrews before and, uh, you know, I, I didn't, don't want to repeat too much and uh, I'll just uh, try and skip and find the uh, final uh, argument that he, uh, he gives. Oh, here it is. In James is. chat, I want to pull up 5a. In James chapter 2, and I, I, I was tempted not to even go to James 2 for this thing, just to see if it could be done. All right? These are works These works through this thing is for God's righteousness. His right, he is going to count you worthy by doing works of obedience, not works of merit, not works of the law, not works of the flesh, works of obedience. When God speaks and he tells us to do something, we do it. All right, the, the meme, I know it's kind of funny, but... Uh, James tells you that for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This is James 2 in verse 26. Faith without works of obedience is a dead faith. And if you can ride a dead faith to Nashville, you can ride that dead faith to heaven. <laughs> if you can ride a dead horse to Nashville, you can ride a dead faith to heaven. That's how it works, man. You got to work obedient. You can't be disobedient and expect to go. Jesus in Matthew 7 24 says that uh, not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does he who does the will the will of my father who is in heaven I want to thank you guys for joining us I know it's been a little bit um, nervous on my end and Tanner's as well and I think me all right uh, I'll just uh, stop it there and uh, we'll go back here um, that was his last uh, argument that he uh, essentially gave, uh, and uh, he, he he cited two passages there. Uh, I'll just mention about the passage with uh, uh, that Jesus Christ spoke. Uh, he that uh, you know, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Uh, that's not uh, that's not uh, contradictory of. So Lafide, again, that, that is descriptive language uh, that Jesus is using. He's essentially saying that, that, that those who uh, simply do, those that do this, they will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he does not say that it's because they do those things that they enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the perspective uh, that I take, the, the biblical perspective says that we are made new creatures in Christ, uh, that uh, God births us again in Christ, uh, that we are, we, are, we are made new, and as new, we have new desires. We have a new nature, which does obey God. Uh, it's not because we obey God that we are uh, born again that we are justified, that we're brought into the family of God, that we inherit the kingdom of heaven. But rather, it's that because of what God does in us, bringing us to spiritual life, giving us a new nature, because of that, we both do inherit the kingdom of heaven, but also out of that new nature, we do good works. The good works do not contribute to our inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, but they flow from the same new nature which, uh, by which we inherit the kingdom of heaven, that nature, that, that uh, working of God towards us. And so there uh, we have descriptive language used by Jesus. Um, uh, the last thing that he mentions 
is James chapter 2. And I gave, uh, I tried to, to give as fast as I could in the debate uh, an uh, explanation and exegesis of James chapter 2, but uh, I got, uh, I, I wasn't able to, to finish in, in about two minutes. Uh, but I got pretty far, but I, I just kind of wanted to go through it uh, here uh, to close this video out uh, and I, just step by step, taking us through uh, James chapter 2. Uh, beginning in verse 14 is where it starts. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And there uh, the, the, uh, the phrase is... Uh, more, uh, it's, it's, it's understood as, can that faith save him? Can the faith that he is claiming, can it save him, his claim to faith? Uh, though he says it, if he has no works, does the claim that he has faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. The illustration here is somebody who makes a promise to someone. They, they, they give lip service that they're going to help them out. Uh, but in the end, they don't help them out. Their, their words are not followed by their actions. And what that demonstrates in a person is that from the beginning, they really did not intend to help them. Uh, even so, a person may say that they have faith, but if their actions don't show the fact that they have faith, then their words are meaningless. They don't genuinely have faith. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? The man says he has faith. Uh, and the question is asked, show me your faith without your works. If you say that you, you have faith, show it to me without works. Uh, the, the point is demonstration of faith. Uh, it's not about how we are uh, declared righteous before God. It's about demonstrating to other people that the faith we have is genuine. Uh, he says, I will show thee my faith by my works. Uh, another illustration is the devils, that uh, they believe in God and their belief causes them to tremble. They genuinely uh, believe that God is. They believe that he is, uh, that he's, he's there and their belief in him causes them to shudder when they, when they think about him. It's shown forth in their behavior that they, that they know who God is. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And he'll pick this up again in a moment. Verse 21, uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. And at this point, we have to, to ask, how is it that James is using the word justified? Is he using it in the same way that Paul is using the word justification, justified? Or is he using it in a different way? Is he using it more in line with uh, somebody showing uh, that they have faith, justifying their faith claim? And that's what I'm going to take. Uh, the Bible does uh, sometimes use the word justified in this way. In Matthew eleven nineteen, I mentioned in the debate, Jesus says that wisdom is justified of her children. Uh, he's not saying here that wisdom has to be declared righteous, that, that, that wisdom has to uh, gain goodness to itself. But rather what he's saying is that those who follow wisdom, the children of wisdom, they demonstrate the goodness of wisdom through their lives. Wisdom is vindicated, justified, shown to be good by what her children do. 
And he's saying in the same way uh, that Abraham, our father, was justified by works. He was vindicated by works before the world. He showed the world that he knew God because of what he uh, did. In verse 22, seest thou how faith uh, wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. The, the, the major point in, the, 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 in this citation, in fact, two citations which are given, uh, is not the, that he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He's not using that in, in any different way than uh, Paul is using it in his letters. But rather, the, the point he's trying to make is that he was called the friend of God. That the world saw Abraham and what he did, that he offered up Isaac, that he was willing to kill his only son, uh, and that they called him and they recognized that he was the friend of God. Because he had faith toward God, it drove him to do these radical things, and people recognized that he was the friend of God. In fact, um, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, one of the, the major works that he wrote, one of the, the ones that, that uh, many Christians will read is uh, Fear and Trembling, which is essentially his uh, explanation and his uh, expounding on how Abraham offered up Isaac and how by offering up Isaac, he demonstrated true faith. And so, uh, that he, he was called the friend of God by what he did offering Isaac. In verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified, vindicated, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Rahab the harlot, again, she demonstrated her faith toward God by harboring these spies, by uh, getting them out of the city safely, even though she knew that it could uh, cost her her life uh, if she was found out, yet she had faith toward God, and that faith drove her to do radical things. And because of that, she was known to be faithful. She was known to be uh the friend of God, just as Abraham was known. Finally, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. He picks up that faith without works is dead. And here he explains himself that just as the body without the spirit is dead, just as the body, and, and the word here is the, the same uh, word that, that's used for wind, that's used for breath uh, when it says spirit. It's the body without the spirit, the body without the breath, the body without the wind is dead. So faith, if it have not works, is dead. If you see a body lying on the ground and it's not evidencing the fact that it's alive by breathing, it's not, it's not showing you that it's alive by breathing, then it's dead. You, you assume that it's dead. A man's not breathing, he's dead. And so too, if you find somebody who claims to have faith, if you find somebody sitting in a church pew and they have no works, they, they, they uh, go out uh, after Sunday uh, service and uh, they immediately go and live like the world does. Uh, they immediately go into the same rot and decay that the world so loves. They give you no reason for believing that they have faith. And as such, because the, it, someone who genuinely has faith, someone who's been saved by Jesus Christ, they have the new nature. They've been made new creatures in Christ. They will evidence by uh, what they do that they have faith in Christ. Then we are justified in judging that the one who says they have faith and has no works does not have faith. Their faith is dead. Their faith is not evidencing to the world. It is not 
vindicated. And so that's what James is talking about. He's not telling us how we get righteous. He's not telling us how we attain to salvation. He's telling us how we uh, see whether somebody's faith is genuine or not. And uh, so the James chapter 2, uh, the final argument that Matt gave on the first night, uh, does not tell us anything in contradiction to the do doctrine of justification by faith alone. Uh, and so with that, I hope this has been uh, useful to somebody. Uh, I'll go back over and I'll see uh, whether I think that uh, another video on this is warranted. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, God bless.